Well, good evening, everyone. My name is Vince Cerf, but I think you figured that part out already. I now need to convince Apple that I am the owner of this computer. <laughs> so uh, now, it's, now the question is, can I remember what my own password is? This is the perils of data communication. Uh, can I get the display up? Folks in the back there? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, let's see if I can get. Yeah, Bruce, if you would prefer to sit down there so you don't have to crane your neck, it's up to you. <laughs> Not that you haven't already seen this stuff. Well, first of all, let me say thank you to uh, uh, the college for uh, the university for inviting both of us uh, to participate in this uh, discussion tonight. Uh, when the invitation got to me, my reaction was, I'm not doing this by myself because I knew Bruce, and Bruce is the guy that really has humanities in his hands. So I personally appreciate his willingness to participate. And I hope that you'll find this discussion uh, of interest, to you. and we certainly are eager now to hear also from you and your questions and ideas on this topic. Now let me start out by uh, inventing a term, digital vellum. You all know that vellum is sheepskin, and it's a very durable uh, surface uh, for writing on. Manuscripts that are a thousand years old or more uh, have survived, and some of them in magnificent form. Uh, you see them illustrated, illuminated, and the like, and they still look as bright and beautiful now as they did a uh, thousand or more years ago. Uh, my big concern is that the uh, digital technologies of the day do not have this long-lasting uh, this longevity, and I am concerned that we somehow assure that our digital content has the same kind of uh, preser preservability. So I want to remind you that uh, we do have many media which have lasted for a long time. Some baked tablets are thousands of years old, for example. Some of them may not have been intended to last that long, but fires caused the tablet to be baked, and they were you know, sort of buried in rubble and discovered later. Uh, some more fragile material has lasted a long time. Uh, for example, uh, papyrus, but, uh, which has been stored away in the dry desert, for instance, has lasted longer than it normally would have. And vellum, of course, has lasted for a very long time. But what about the digital uh, kinds of content that we are familiar with today? Uh, now, some of you may say it's not worth preserving anyway, so we shouldn't worry about it. Uh, but for those of you with mobile cameras uh, or mobile phones with cameras who are taking bazillions of pictures, thinking that they're digital and they're going to last forever should be warned that that may not be the case. We have evidence that a photograph, a printed photograph, can last for 150 years or more, but we do not have any evidence that a digital image can last longer than a decade or two because we've not even had computers around for 70 years, more than 70 years. So that's a big issue. I want to give you an example of why I worry about this. You all know Doris Kearns Goodwin and that wonderful book that she wrote a uh, team of rivals about Lincoln's cabinet uh, assembled out of all the people who ran against him for president. So if you read the book, uh, you get this feeling of a considerable amount of reality to the dialogue which she reconstructs. And the question is, how did she do that? And the answer is she went to various universities and libraries and reassembled the uh, written dialogue among the principals. And then from that took the topics and their positions and recreated very believable dialogue. Uh, now, if you were a 22nd century Doris Kearns Goodwin and you were trying to reproduce the dialogue of the 21st century, you might be challenged by this. Is the email still around? What about the tweets? What about the blogs? What about all of the other web pages? Would they really be around? Will the National Archives be able to offer uh, the kind of content that Doris Kearns Goodwin found for the Lincoln administration? All of those things may not, in fact, survive. Now, we're all familiar with digital media. Some of you may still have five and a quarter inch floppy disks, which you can't read, uh, three and a half inch floppy disks, which you also can't read, and maybe eight inch long disks uh, drives from the you know, long word processors. Maybe you even have VHS you know, tapes, uh, which you used to watch and value and think these would last forever, except there are no readers left that can read them. And the same thing is already happening to things like CD-ROMs and DVDs. Uh, companies like Apple make laptops like the one I'm using right now that don't have a DVD reader in them. So uh, we are at some risk, not necessarily because of the medium itself, but because the readers for them may not be available. But it gets worse. 
what about executable content? And again, I, you know, if you're not worried that somebody won't be able to play Angry Birds uh, 50 years from now, <laughs> maybe that doesn't matter. But there are a lot of other kinds of uh, executable content that we should worry about. Spreadsheets, for example, and you know, digital documents, PowerPoint presentations, and the like are all potentially of value and at least some of them ought to be preserved. And even if you think not all of them should be, we should not be bereft of the ability to decide to preserve something if we think it's valuable. We all know that sometimes things are preserved by accident. What I don't want to have happen is that we are prevented from preserving things because the technology to do it is not available to us. That is not acceptable. Now, there are a bazillion challenges, and this is supposed to be a 10-minute introduction, so I'm not going to walk through all of these things. But what I worry about, the central theme of my concern, is that it takes software to correctly interpret and render the bits of these digital objects, whether it's a spreadsheet, a presentation, a document, or, or a game, or something else, or a database of scientific information. It takes software to do that. Now, how does software work? Well, it runs on a computer. It's an application, and it may have to have an operating system that holds the application while it's running. And that operating system needs to run on a piece of hardware. Fifty years from now, that piece of hardware may not be available. Fifty years from now, or even ten years from now, the operating system that ran that application may not be available to run even on the existing hardware, let alone the older hardware. So what happens is that our ability to interpret the bits may dissipate over time. This is one of the fundamental problems we have to worry about. It gets worse because people own software, and you, know, you can't just freely take it and use it. You may have to license it. You, uh, if a company goes out of business, what happens to the source code? Do you, do you have the right to demand the source code because the company no longer supplies the application or the operating system? Bankruptcy court laws are really weird about preserving assets and selling them. It's a very, very messy uh, space, including things like uh, intellectual property rights and things of that sort. And then how, who's going to store all the bits? It's going to cost money to store all that stuff for some period of time. I imagine that it's year 3000 and you've just done a Google search and you've turned up a 1997 PowerPoint file. Let's imagine you're running Windows 3000. And the question is, you know, does it know how to interpret a thousand year old file? And the answer is maybe not. Now, there is a place at Carnegie Mellon that uh, Mahadev Satya Narayanan, whom we normally call Satya for obvious reasons, um, <laughs> has run a project called Olive, which basically takes a digital snapshot of a computer that's running the operating system in the application and interpreting a file. Now, this is sort of like a digital x-ray that's a metaphor. Please don't take this literally. But the idea is to capture information about how did the hardware work and describe that, then how does the operating system run in an emulated version of the hardware, then how do I run the application in that operating system in order to interpret a file. He succeeded in actually doing this, and we don't have time to go into detail about how, but it's a very important um, part of the solution. There are other projects that are also focused on uh, things like this. The Internet Archive in San Francisco, run by Brewster Kale. Uh, the Library of Alexandria in Egypt is his backup facility for, uh, for the digital archive. And he's copying pages off the World Wide Web. He's scanning books. Uh, he's uh, also capturing software when he's permitted to do that uh, and archiving all of this uh, in his facility in San Francisco. The Computer History Museum uh, in Silicon Valley is also accumulating digital content, software, and documentations and the like. And Google, as many of you know, uh, has been scanning books for some time now and has uh, created a digital archive uh, in the Culture Institute in France, uh, which just had its fifth anniversary. They are scanning at high resolution images from museums all around the world. So you could literally assemble a virtual museum uh, if you wanted to through the Cultural Institute web pages. So these are examples of the things that are going on, but uh, this problem is by no means solved. And it's Bruce's turn to, uh, to take you uh, further along in this discussion. And in the course of our conversation, I hope you will see ba both the potential of digitized content and the brittle risk that we face with all the content that we think we're preserving by digitizing, which may in fact 
not have the lifetime that we expect. So I'll stop there and ask Bruce to continue. Well, I'm honored to be here. Thank you, Provost, for that kind introduction. Uh, and thank you all for coming. Uh, and I have to thank Reza, because she saved me from Snowmageddon. <laughs> I was uh, not in Washington, but I was in the Midwest. And uh, I began to worry and uh, emailed Reza, who took charge and got me here. So thank you. Um, so. Um, let me begin with a confession. I'm a latecomer to the digital humanities, and you see I'm actually reading <laughs> from paper. Actually, uh, so I'm a latecomer. I was still using a manual typewriter while, while all my colleagues were working on their PCs. And one day, my wife, fed up with my aversion to technology, bought a computer, set it up on my desk and said, use it. I obeyed and dutifully wrote my manuscripts on it, used it for email, but not much more. But I was still doubtful about the so-called wonders of digitization and the internet. It was only when I arrived at the National Endowment for the Humanities that I had my road to Damascus moment. There, the scales fell from my eyes, and I saw the wonders and promises of the digital world being explored by NEH grantees. That experience convinced me that in the future, the most important acquisition and dissemination of humanity's knowledge would be digital. Consequently, the NEH established the Office of Digital Humanities with principally the advice of Vince Cerf, and is now, I'm proud to say, a leader in the field. But enough of me. When I was asked by Riza and also Vint, because Riza asked Vint, and then Vint emailed me, and he said, would you like to join me in this lecture? And I said, well, let me think about it. Yes. <laughs> When I was asked by them to speak on the future of the humanities in the digital age, I thought immediately of that baseball great and philosopher, Yogi Berra, who said, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future. <laughs> I'm with Yogi because, in my experience, the only thing that's predictable about the digital future is its unpredictability. Nonetheless, I'll have hazard several speculations on the future of the humanities in the digital age in two broad categories, sort of macro and micro. The first is the, what I call the delivery system of the humanities, and the second is humanities research. Now, by delivery system, I mean how the humanities are broadly disseminated. And here I will confine my remarks, I think appropriately, to colleges and universities the mechanics and structure of which will, I believe, undergo substantial change in the digital humanities era. For instance, we think of a library building as a core element of a university, and I saw your very beautiful, fine library on the way over here. We think of that library as something that is at the heart of academic research and teaching. But what a university board of trustees, and I was on a university board of trustees not too long ago, so I'm really interested in this, a board of trustees, a body entrusted to plan for the future, be wise to authorize in 2016 a large edifice costing millions of dollars to hold printed books and periodicals when students and professors will be able to ac access most of them from the comfort of their homes and offices. And these fundamental changes are already underway as libraries increasingly move books to off-site locations. Recently, the New York Public Library, undoubtedly one of the finest research centers in the world, proposed to ship 4 million books and periodicals 
off, off site to Princeton, New Jersey, 60 miles away. Four million. The seven stories of the library stacks would be gutted and turned into computer centers, coffee shops, and amenities for patrons. These transformations from physical to digital sites have already occurred. Think about the closing of borders in many Barnes and Noble bookstores, or the disappearance of blockbusters and other video stores with the advent of Netflix and now Amazon Video, or the dominance of iTunes and other streaming sources for, mu for music. And think more widely about the enormous changes in the way we bank, how many times do we visit banks now, or buy our airline tickets, or communicate with each other, or use a library. Recently, the Wall Street Journal published an article entitled, In the Age of Google, Librarians Get Shelved. Sorry, sorry, Vin. <laughs> Written by a public librarian, it explains how the internet has changed the role and even the need for librarians. The author describes how many people now working in public libraries no longer have MLS degrees. In fact, many library schools are fast disappearing. Chicago and Columbia, which offered some of the finest degrees, closed their library schools in the early 1990s as new positions called technology assistants, and these are smart folks, techies with community college degrees, replaced librarians with traditional MLSs. The author of the Wall Street Journal remorsefully concludes that, quote, the public library of the future might be a computer center staffed by IT professionals, unquote. He also says that if he didn't, quote, spend his time making change and helping people look for lost keys, wallets, and jackets, he's not sure he would have a job at all. Now, would these same university trustees who might be wise to shelve plans for a new library also have second thoughts about funding multi-million dollar classroom buildings as interactive online teaching and learning technology promise new ways of instruction and effective, cost-effective teaching outside of the traditional classroom. This is obviously a hot button issue, but if you're thinking about capital investments, it's something that needs to be considered. Now let's turn from my first category of humanities delivery systems to my second category, the future of humanities research in the digital age. And this looks, <clears throat> to me anyway, very bright indeed. In 2004, Kevin Kelly, Wired Magazine, one of my favorite internet prophets, wrote what was at the time a highly controversial article. You may have read it, and you may remember the furor that this caused. This, this article was entitled, Scan This Book! Exclamation point. In it, he speculates on how the internet will transform the future of the book and the library. And that this piece, at least to me, remains endlessly fascinating and thought-provoking, and especially this passage, quote, the common vision of the library's future, even the e-book future, assumes that books will remain isolated items, independent from one another, just as they are on the shelves of your public library. There, is, each book is pretty much aware, unaware of the next. When an author completes a book, it is fixed and finished. Its only movement comes when a reader picks it up to animate it with his or her animation. In this vision, the main advantage of the coming digital library is portability. The nifty translation of a book's full text into bits which permit it to be read on a screen anywhere. And I was just reading, uh, Google, uh, Amazon Kindle was launched one year after this article was written. Uh, Amazon would be happy if they got an initial order of 500. So the, the translation of books uh, into bits, which permit it to be read anywhere on a screen, like Amazon or your computer. But Kelly says, this vision misses the chief revolution 
birth by scanning books. In the universal library, no book will be an island. Unquote. And here's what I think is one of his key points. Quote, turning ink letters into electronic dots can be read on a screen is simply the first essential step in creating this new library. The real magic will come in the second act, as each word in each book is cross-listed, clustered, cited, extracted, indexed, analyzed, annotated, remixed, reassembled, and woven deeper into the culture than ever before. In the new world of books, every bit inf informs another. Every page reads all pages. Now, we don't have this library yet. But it's coming, and you'll be able to hold it in the palm of your hand. One harbinger of this is Wikipedia, one of the 10 top most visited websites in the world and the most consulted internet reference work. Wikipedia has redefined the encyclopedia in many ways, and I'm a big fan. Unlike paper and ink versions, it has no space limit. And unlike, say, the Encyclopedia Britannica, no gatekeepers who define what knowledge is important. I've written for the Encyclopedia Britannica. How does that work? Somebody finds out about me through somebody else, and an editor sends me a letter, this is before email, and says, would you like to write an article on this topic? And I said, yeah, of course, Encyclopedia Britannica. And will you give me a full set if I do that? And they said, yes. So who looks at that? A sub-editor and then an editor. And then it gets enshrined. The gatekeepers have said, this is an important subject, and this is the guy who can write about it. But there are no gatekeepers in the Wikipedia. So, and there are no limits. So in Wikipedia, you can find information about Mozart or an obscure garage band of the 70s, about a super collider or a 19th century steam engine, or about Lincoln or the type of telegraph machine that brought him news of the latest Union victory. But even better are the thousands and thousands of links that simultaneously allow a deep dive into a particular topic and also entry into the world of millions of tangential subjects. And I'm sure you've all felt this as you use Wikipedia or other wikis. Now, to me, this looks like the future of the humanities research and research tools. Take the Barrington Atlas of the Greek and Roman world. And if you don't want to learn about it, you can check out its entry in Wikipedia. <laughs> in its printed version, the atlas is frozen in time once it comes off the press. That's Kelly's fixed and finished. Very useful, but immutable. In its wiki-like digital version, it's dynamic, and it's open-ended, and easily revised with new material, new archaeological finds, GPS data, links to new publications, videos, sound recordings, and a whole host of material which will make it even more useful. And like Wikipedia, allowing for continual modification, correction, addition, improvement, and collaboration. In fact, the DNA of the internet is collaborative. And collaborative research offers future opportunity for mining the massive amounts of material on a scale hitherto impossible. A good case in point is prosopography. And I had to practice that. I know what it is, but I very seldom say that word. Prosopography, it's that branch of history which analyzes huge amounts of material, usually about groups of people to find patterns and relationships, often biographical, which are impossible to discover from printed sources. For example, when the papers of the first four US presidents are fully digitized, prosperography will reveal in detail, among a myriad of other things, when and where they acted, how many times, and how they used the word liberty or slavery, or what their connections were with other key players in the early years of our country. Good examples of this sort already exist. They are the prosperography of the Byzantine world and the early modern London theaters. Massive works, 
both published by the Department of Digital Humanities at King's College London, which has been a trailblazer in this field. The development of other similar digital humanities center will, I'm certain, become a key part of the study of the humanities at San Diego State University and at more and more campuses across the United States. And one of the things that the NIH did when, when I was there, and I'm doing now, is to give seed money that set up these centers. So I, I hope you're doing that here. Other exciting projects on the horizon, such as the scanning and cataloging of thousands of art objects, the reconstruction of cities decade by decade, or interactive websites with enormous amounts of primary source material promise to enlarge the breadth and depths of humanity studies. Just one such venture I'll talk about very briefly is Chronicling America, a project, a joint project of the NEH and the Library of Congress launched when I was there. This will give you a page view. In other words, it'll show you what a page of a newspaper looks like for every newspaper ever published in the United States in every language, and there were scores and scores of foreign language papers published in the United States up to the 20th century. You will see the advertisements. You will see the editorials. You will see the letters to the editors. So if you're looking for, say, um, Bint mentioned Doris Kearns Goodwin, results of the election of 1860 in a small county in Ohio, you will be able to find that and compare and contrast. It will be the great one, the, probably the greatest resource available on your computers of any other source for American history. Now, obviously, I see a bright future for the humanities in the digital age, but I would be unrealistic not to note that there are hazards as well, some of the things that Vint has already talked about. Will be, we be able to preserve digital materials as we move from what one platform to the other? Can emails and websites and texts with important humanities context be preserved? What about copyright and other revenue generating material? Can tools be developed fast enough to mine the mountains of digital material? These are hard questions to answer. Because, as Yogi wisely said, it's tough to make predictions, especially about the future, and I'll add, about the, especially about the future of the humanities in the digital age. Only time will tell. Thank you. Just uh, to set the record straight, I realize you were saved from Snowmageddon. I came here from Maui, so I consider that to be, that was a, a hardship decision. Um, That's not fair. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, my wife is back in Washington in the snow uh, storm, so you can imagine uh, there was some uh, awkwardness about that. <coughs> Look, uh, Bruce, let me ask a couple of questions. Um, the first one has to do with the library of today. Those libraries have some rights associated with their preservation of content. Uh, I guess I'm asking about this. I'm assuming that there are things that libraries get to do that other institutions might not be permitted to do uh, because they are libraries. If that is correct, then one wonders about rights that might be given to organizations to preserve digital content, which might include, for example, the right to use software that might not otherwise be readily available to everyone else. Am I going down a path that makes any sense? And if, if I am, um, is there any movement in the copyright community, for example, to grant digital preservation rights that I suspect we're going to need? Yeah, um, not, not that I know about, not in any large scale. And one of the things that is so important about um, digitization is that it's a preservation tool. So if you're thinking about how important this is, just reflect on newspapers that I just talked about. I mean, before 1850 or so, 
newspapers were made of uh, rag paper. In fact, printers were running out of rags, and they had somebody had this idea to bring out the mummies and use all that <laughs> rag material. I'm not, I'm not kidding. But after that, you get acidic paper. So if you think about your newspaper, leave it out in the sun a couple of days and see what happens to it. And these vast archives of uh, newspapers are turning to dust, literally. So by digitizing them, you preserve them, supposedly. Yes, only to the extent that the digital the content that, so is, in is fact, a huge, yes. A huge um, a problem which you know, not only threatens the preservation of you know, the Cleveland Plain Dealer from 1900 to 1980, but also all our other records. Um, because we're all living in this digital world and you know, we do our banking, as I said, and the travel, et cetera. So uh, let me give you another example of a technical problem uh, that arises. You all use the World Wide Web. You all know the term URL, which stands for Uniform Record Locator. You probably have heard the term domain name. You know that embedded in a URL is a domain name. You may know that in order to go to a particular website, the computer you're using finds the URL, extracts the domain name from the URL string, looks up the domain name in something called the domain name system, and maps that domain name, like www.google.com, into a numerical internet protocol address which tells the software where is the computer on the network that contains the URL. And so it's getting a literally a physical address of a place to exchange traffic with to pull the web page up. In the early stages of the internet's evolution, it was turned on in 83, around 1984, the domain name system was invented. Domain names were freely available. You got a domain name from a guy named John Postel at USC Information Sciences Institute, no charge. But around 1992, the National Science Foundation was paying for the operation of the domain name system management. And they realized they were spending research dollars on what was looking more and more like something benefiting the commercial private sector. Why would I spend research dollars on that? So Network Solutions, the company that was managing the primary domain name system, has said, can we charge people to register a domain name and to run the mapping service? And they said, yes, why not? Then we won't waste research dollars which should be spent on research. So people started being charged for their registration of domain names, and there's nothing wrong with that, except for the fact that if you stop paying for your annual charge, then the resolution of that domain name would cease to work because it would be lost from the uh, tables, the registry tables. That means that the World Wide Web is not a stable information environment because if a domain name goes away for any reason, then the URLs that you referred to in the documents that you were working with would no longer resolve. Everybody in the room has experienced 404, page not found. And so that is a fragile and brittle aspect of today's World Wide Web. We need to move from there to permanent identifiers which don't change and which are bound to digital objects and can be preserved in perpetuity. The, the, binding preserved in perpetuity and the trans translation into where is it uh, also preserved. It's going to take money to do that. And it's going to take a change in the way in which we assign identifiers to our digital content. There exists a system to do that. It's called digital object identifiers. Bob Kahn, my partner in the internet design, and I started working on that in 1988. Uh, he has continued the work. Sometimes you'll see in published uh, research reports, DOI colon and then a string. That's a, that's a digital object identifier. So the reason I bring this up is that it's an example of how we can build, paint ourselves into a corner. And we have to find a way to reinvent uh, 
the way we reference things. If we don't do that, imagine all the interlinkages among all the web pages and the documents that we write that make references to other documents failing to link up. Now, the, the hope for the future was expressed exquisitely by John McCarthy, one of the inventors of artificial intelligence, at a, a digital library discussion in 1988 when he said to me, Vint, do you know that 100 years from now, people will say that there were books 100 years ago that didn't talk to each other? And the whole idea is that these books would update themselves with more current references and the like. There are probably some implications of that, Bruce. Do you have any thoughts? Well, I just wanted to say just a kind of very concrete example of what you're talking about. As I was thinking about um, this talk, I'm sort of rummaging through my mind about really interesting projects that we had done in the endowment and that would have broad popular appeal. And one of the um, Grant said I liked best was a, to build this really amazing website for the movie Casablanca. And this was the fruit of a lot of research. So you could see Casablanca, then you could see all the director's cuts, you could see um, all the director's notes, you could look at the screen tests, you could look at the book, and you could um, drill deep down and then overlay so you came away with an entirely different picture mm -hmm. of what that famous movie no, was no like. Pun, no pun intended, right? No, yeah, <laughs> right. Okay, no, fair pun, no pun yeah. intended. And <laughs> so I thought, ah, that's good. I'm going to go and see where they are, and I'm going to talk about that. Couldn't find it. Gone. Couldn't find it. So it has disappeared. Uh, and this is a, you know, a real, I think, concrete example of of what can happen. And, you know, there's other, now the issue of born digital material. Uh, we write our manuscripts uh, with word processing. We, very few of us write letters, although I think that people write more than they did when they were writing with pen and ink because it's easier and there's a huge volume of email and texting. But a lot of that is important, you know, not only for the humanities, but in many other places. How do we preserve that? Um, so we could have a huge gap in the kind of creative process uh, and acquisition of information um, just lost to us. I mean, if you have, you know, uh, tablets and vellum and rag paper, that stuff sticks around. But so we're entering into this territory that is really ha challenging and, and hazardous and scary. So uh, you've already inferred a few things that I find interesting about having digital content available. And I want us, by the way, in this conversation, not to be trapped into thinking only of book as a work. There are lots of other works that can be digitized, whether you know interactive games and the spreadsheets and so on. Uh, and some of them are very complex objects, things that include multiple media, uh, things that allow a kind of depth of exploration and interaction. You alluded to a couple of examples which I resonate with. One of them is the ability to take the digital content and analyze it in ways that you would not do by hand because it would just be too time consuming and too hard. But having uh, works which like the Shakespeare, copies of the Shakespeare First Folio were not all printed at the same time. I shouldn't say, I said that badly. Copies of the Shakespeare plays were not all printed at the same time. The First Folio was printed in whatever it was, 1623 or something. Um, but the, we got replications of the plays. If you could analyze the sequence of, uh, of plays, you might understand how they evolved, but getting them in the right order takes a fair amount of work, like having a computer put the digital uh, jigsaw together. So being able to apply computer power to these digitized works gives us the ability to analyze in ways that we could not do before or would not do because of its um, time-consuming uh, expense. Well, are there other kinds of things that come to mind, Bruce, about how we might use these born digital objects uh, in ways that we would not be able to do with more conventional media? Yeah, I think there are lots and lots of opportunities, but I just wanted to go back to the Shakespeare because one of the things we sponsored when I was in the age was uh, digitization of all the first folios. This was led by the Folger Library, and it's just not that you acquire new knowledge, but you know, 
you acquire new knowledge in a different way. And so you can overlay all these first folios. And then you can see the differences. You can see you know, what all the printer's variations uh, are. And then you can begin to see about how words were used, you know, what the er derivation of these words were, what they were in their context. So it's just not a matter of getting new information. It's putting these packets of information uh, together to really create new knowledge. And that's why I think it is, in many ways, the future uh, of the humanities. I mean, this is a big issue with stuff that's born uh, digital. You know, where does it reside? You know, how long can it last? What are the proprietary uh, issues? And I don't think this has really been faced. And another thing we need is we need tools to help us sort out mm -hmm. this material. You know, and one of the things that we, at the NH, we mimicked Google by offering grants for tool building. And we said mm -hmm. for the first time, we expect that some of these grants will actually fail. And it was interesting because the application for this grant was a, sort of a different order from the rest of NEH grants. 90% of the people applying for these grants were first time applicants to the endowment. And so, yeah, I, I, I think we don't have the mechanism. I don't think we have the concerted sort of universal effort that we need to get this done, to preserve it and to mine it and disseminate it. So in, in a sense, um, making this kind of content widely available offers the opportunity to let anyone who wants to have a go at trying to make these uh, digital versions more useful, uh, it, it, we are, it's an enabling uh, kind of action to make these, these things so widely accessible, which is why the Google uh, book scanning project uh, is in part motivated uh, by that. I was going to mention one other interesting thing that Michael Whitmore, who runs the Folger Library, did a little test. Uh, he accumulated uh, a huge collection of phrases from the Shakespeare plays, and then he proceeded to analyze current day documents and extract from them phrases and words that were introduced by Shakespeare in order to get a sense for how influential Shakespeare's words have been in our everyday discourse. And it's pretty astonishing what a lacework of emptiness you found in these documents when you took out all of the things that were Shakespearean in origin. So it, it was a, a graphic, powerful way of demonstrating how Shakespeare has influenced uh, our own language and our use of it. Uh, so. I'm, I've been making notes while you were talking, and I can't read my own handwriting. Well, let me just say, uh, while you're looking, that um, you know there are these tools now um, for sort of word recognition and phrase recognition and repetition. So I remember that I didn't believe any of this. I thought this was impossible. You know, did Shakespeare really write? Uh, you know those plays, but you remember when Joel Klein? Well, first primary colors came out by Anonymous is about the Clinton campaign. And nobody know, knew who wrote, wrote it. And um, one of these people was interested in this kind of um, you know, sort of um, searching of text and manipulation of phrases and words, actually ran the thing and came up with Joel Klein. And he was right. And That's this amazing. is when okay. the, the author was first exposed. So um, there are just infinite possibilities. You're telling me that uh, there isn't any privacy anymore. Get over no, it. Absolutely okay. Not. <laughs> um, there are a couple of. You mentioned something else, which I find kind of interesting. If you're in the hard copy publication business, you run out of space basically because you can't afford to print anything longer than X number of pages, or the font will be too small for anybody to read. Um, if you are uh, using uh, conventional mass media like television and radio, you run out of time basically because you're given some time limits for how long you can run a particular show. But as you point out, the internet doesn't run out of space or time. It only runs out of your patience, your willingness to go through all these things. Which brings up uh, a complaint that I got from Henry Kissinger over lunch a few years ago. 
uh, Henry looked at me and he said, I hate the internet. I said, well, that's when the lunch is over, that's it. And I said, well, why, why is that? And he said, he's, he was unhappy because people would do Google searches and be satisfied with two paragraphs of, of response, but he writes 700 page books. So he was not happy about the fact that we were allowing ourselves to be satisfied with too little information. Uh, and in a sense, the, uh, the internet does that, but it also facilitates the other behavior, which is exploring uh, forever and ever, amen. And uh, earlier today, you were mentioning that uh, when you were growing up, you had an encyclopedia available. I did too. Uh, yours, mine was Compton's Illustrated Encyclopedia. Was a world book. Yeah. And, uh, and the thing is that you could get lost in there going from one topic to another. The same thing happens to me on Wikipedia. I don't know about the rest of you, but you, it's so easy to just click on something and there you go, and then you can't Down figure it out. Down the rabbit hole, really. Um, you know, they're developing, I can't remember the name of it, a new thing, which is a kind of digital typewriter, which has all the advantages of um, word processing and the sophistication and ease, but it has no connection with the internet. And why is that? Because who can write anything without getting onto the internet? You know, it is really wonderful and distracting uh, at the same time. So this will make you just concentrate on what you're writing without any internet. Well, I hate that idea. <laughs> <laughs> Actually, to be really honest, I had an experience that echoes your, your comment. Uh, there was a power outage. And uh, the internet wasn't available, and I knew I had to get finished with a particular essay. And so I sat down with a pen and a pad, oh, and I started to write. And I got about three words into it, and then I realized I needed to look something up because I didn't know exactly what it was going, uh, what the answer was, and I couldn't because the net wasn't available. And I actually gave up. I was so frustrated, <laughs> I could not write without being online, and I was kind of shocked, actually, because I remembered in the past being able to sit down and write out something longhand and then, you know, come back and do the edit and everything else. But I could, I did not, I was unwilling to make myself do that because it was too easy to be able to sit there and, and pull things up uh, at need. Well, I can't write longhand anymore. I mean, it is really difficult for me to write anymore. I sort of lost that skill and the uh, uh, fluidity. I so somehow think I should be able to do that. I think. You know, these great authors, they just get a yellow legal pad and they sit down and they, in their study and they write it. But uh, that's, that's not possible. But it is like going down the rabbit hole. Because I remember I was looking something up on Wikipedia. And then, you know, one of these links caught my eye. And I was looking at this article on Little Titch, who was a 19th century British vaudeville performer. <laughs> And then it took me to, you know, where he <laughs> performed, and, you know, then I got into, uh, I, you know, it's just, you have to pull back. So, you know, you learn a lot, but a lot of it is just, but the other thing is, you know, the sort of 800 pound gorilla in the room is there's this, all this information, mountains and mountains of information, but you have to have some discernment mm -hmm. to be able to use it. And we were saying at lunch, you know, people say, how do you know that's true? Mm -hmm. Well, I read it on the internet. Okay. Uh. Uh, but, you know, I think what colleges and universities and um, high schools should be teaching is how do you use the web? I mean, how do you sort out the wheat from the chaff? What about how are these things sources? What are the reliability of the authors? Of course, to do that, you've got to go <laughs> back to the web to find out, but it, it's, you know, it brings knowledge, but not necessarily wisdom. So I have an anecdote to, to share with you. I was meeting with uh, some teachers, uh, college teachers, and we were talking about uh, their normal daily affairs, and uh, one teacher told me that she, uh, she hated the internet too, and I said, why is that? She said, well, my students bring their laptops and their tablets to my class, and, uh, and they're using them while I'm lecturing. And I thought she was going to be angry because they were doing Facebook or some other thing. No, no, that wasn't it. They were actually looking stuff up that she was talking about and then, and then arguing with her. And she said, 
I'm the teacher, you know, you shouldn't be asking questions like this. And I'm sitting here thinking, holy moly, you got these kids engaged. What is it you didn't understand? They said, okay, so let's use this, this um, uh, behavior. Let's uh, give 10 web pages and let the students pick any one of the 10. The job, the assignment, is to go to that web page, analyze the content that's on the web page, and then come back in an essay and explain whether or not the content of the web page should be accepted or rejected and on what basis and for what reason. And oh, by the way, you're not done if the only place you looked is the internet. There is this other place. It's called a library, and it has things in it called books. And if you don't show me evidence that you also took advantage of content that's not on the internet to do the analysis, then you didn't finish your assignment. So this is a way of just turning this completely around and forcing people to start thinking critically about what they're reading, which is the point that uh, Bruce was making. And I think that of all the skills that we now need as denizens of this online world, it's learning to think critically about what we're seeing, reading, and hearing, not just on the net, but every medium, whether it's newspapers, magazines, television, radio, our friends, our families, they're all sources of potential misinformation, some of it deliberate, some of it by accident, uh, you know, some of it from ignorance. But because it's misinformation, our job and now our responsibility is to try to evaluate and analyze that. So I, I hope that uh, the online environment will help us do that. Uh, but we cannot escape the fact that there is so much information that a lot of it is wrong. And it's our responsibility to figure out what is right and what is not, at least to the best of our ability. How are we doing for time? Uh, we are, it, it, there's a clock oh, here. There's a countdown, okay. This is, you know, this is, you know how you can tell that you're at a Wagner opera? It, it, you go in at 7.30, and at quarter to 10, you look at your watch, and it's 7.45. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, so according to this, it's 7.14, and we were, uh, we thought you guys would probably like to ask questions. Uh, so we're happy to, to do that. I was just wanted to mention one other thing, if I could, and then if you'd like, we should go well, that, It reminds it. me of, well, I think it was Mark Twain's quote about Wagner's opera. It's better than it sounds. <laughs> <laughs> right. So the only other thing I wanted to mention is something you brought up, um, and that is the uh, fact that these digital objects that we deal with are potentially very live and interactive. And a good example of this is Google Maps. Uh, those of you who use the maps to navigate will know about the turn-by-turn -turn kinds of information that uh, the map system tries to offer. It also tries to capture real-time information about traffic congestion and the like. Uh, we acquired a company called Waze a few years ago, which takes reports coming from people who are out there in the traffic saying something about where congestion is being experienced. And so it is this living, real-time nature of the online environment which we have never really experienced before. And I think that for many of the ways in which this online environment manifests are not predictable, and that we're going to have to live through them in order to encounter both the positive and not so positive side effects to understand how we should employ uh, this technology. Yeah. So, Well, then my, I have an interesting, I think, um, personal observation about Google Maps, which I love. I use them all the time. I mean, I can't get anywhere without Google Maps. But it's really changed sort of my perception of time and space. I mean, when you're looking at a physical map, you're looking at a lot of stuff. You're not only looking at your route, but you're looking at you know, your state, and you're looking at um, the whole context of it. With Google Maps, I don't know. I just know where I'm going. I don't know what's around me. Not, oh, you know, yeah. I, and, and I think there are lots of other sort of perception changing um, aspects of the, of the web as well. Yeah, it's fair. Uh, the other thing I should warn you, by the way, if you're using Google Maps, one thing you want is to have a good GPS reception because the maps go slightly nuts. If it's getting bad GPS data and you hear it say, turn left, turn right, make a U-turn, you know, and you think, boy, it's really spazzing there. Uh, <laughs> I, and I had that experience in Santa Monica a few weeks ago, and I called up the guys who were you know, doing Google Maps saying, what is that? 
And they said, well, when it doesn't get very good information from GPS, it can't figure out where you are, and so you appear to be hopping around in various places, <laughs> and it's trying to figure out what to do. So uh, you know, it, make sure you have it up there on the dashboard where you can get a good signal.